again, a warm welcome from my side. Seja muito bem-vindo. Um, before going on, um, please make sure that you choose the right language for you. So um, click on the globe button at the bottom and you can choose either English or Portuguese according to your preference. So please make sure that you are in the right channel. If you change your mind, you can always uh, switch back during the web conference. My name is Lisa Tostado and I'm glad that you're joining today from wherever you are. Um, I work for the European Union office of the Heinrich Böll Foundation. That is the Germ German Green Political Foundation that is affiliated with the Green Party that is represented in Germany's federal parliament. Um, we are co-organizing this event today with the Institute for Agriculture and Trade Policy, IATP. Um, and we are doing so to present four fact sheets um, around different problematic aspects um, of the trade section of the association, association agreement between the European Union and the Mercosur countries. So Brazil, Paraguay, Uruguay, um, and Argentina. Um, that was concluded in late June 2019 after 20 years of negotiations. But the planned agreement is still highly controversial, both within civil society and among governments. Um, and before the agreement can enter into force, depending on its form, it still needs the approval of the European Parliament, of the 27 member states of the European Union, and the national parliaments of the Mercosur countries. And in the context of the European Green Deal with the climate law, the farm to fork strategy, the biodiversity strategy, and also the intent of the European Commission to green the trade, it is now really important to foster a debate on this specific deal and its implication, but also on how sustainable trade policy for the first 20, 21st century should and could look like. And the fact sheets are intended to provide some context, um, data and figures about the expected impacts of this agreement as it stands. And um, there are four pages each, and they can be used as a good starting point and an overview for further discussions, and they also include a comprehensive list of sources. And we will hear more about these fact sheets um, by one of the lead authors um, at the beginning. And we will then have political comments from um, a member of the European pa Parliament, from civil society, from Brazil, and from a research and think tank um, institute in France. And at the end, the panelists will answer your questions. So you can uh, think about good questions as of now and um, ask them in the questions and answers section. Um, as we only have 60 minutes, without further ado, I now pass the floor to Shefali Sharma. She is the director of the Institute for Agriculture and Trade Policy European Office, and her work um, and publication has focused on the economic, social, and environmental impacts of the global meat and dairy industries. And she also examines how international trade rules and global governance on food security and climate intersect with that sector. And she's the author of the climate fact sheet uh, and will now tell us more about um, yeah, the work on these four fact sheets. Please, Shefali, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, good evening here in Europe. Uh, good afternoon in um, Brazil and in other Mercosur countries. Um, yes, I have the daunting task of presenting four fact sheets in about 15 minutes, so I will try my best. Um, Maybe we can move to the, the slide with the four fact sheets. So you can see the next, yeah. So you can see these are the aspects we covered. We looked at climate, um, food safety, pesticides, and government procurement programs. I'm gonna talk, next slide. I'm, I'm gonna talk about the climate one first. Um, we looked at the impacts on um, the climate commitments of both regions and also the land use impact of this trade deal. The EU is set to increase its climate pledge to 55 to 60 percent below 1990 levels and become carbon neutral by 2050. Brazil, the largest trading partner from the Mercosur countries, pledged to reduce by 2025 its net greenhouse gas emissions by 37 percent compared to 2005 levels. Uh, and what we know is that um, while 64% of EU's greenhouse gas emissions are embedded in its food supply and they come from intra-EU trade, 25% are displaced emissions from Latin American imports. 76% um, of all EU land use change emissions are related to the imports of oil seeds, mostly soy and vegetable oils, uh, and are tied to the EU meat production 
uh, the meat sector. Brazil is actually going in the opposite direction uh, compared to what its climate goals are, recording the highest levels of deforestation in a decade, deregulating and weakening institutions responsible for climate policy and environmental protection, and transferring the administration of indigenous lands to the Ministry of Agriculture. Um, last year, it increased its emissions by 9.6%. 72% of those were from agriculture and land use. So if we know that a quarter of EU's food supply emissions were imported from Latin America, what is the Mercosur deal going to do when it's going to increase by 50% its um, beef quota? The EU is going to increase its beef quota by 50% um, and also for pork and poultry and a six-fold increase of bioethanol imports to the EU. Now, 74% of beef imports into the EU already came from Mercosur countries in 2019. And uh, this graph that you see in front of you is a science for policy report uh, from the European Commission's Joint Research Center, which estimates that from uh, the evidence that they have of governance since 2012, uh, a, business and usual, a business as usual scenario would result in Brazil emitting 900 million CO, uh, tons of CO2 above its own climate target by 2030. What it needs to do, on the other hand, if it were to meet its goal, is to actually reduce, so you look at that line, uh, to 22 million tons. So what we can see is this was done a couple of years ago, this study, and, and what we've seen under the Bolsonaro administration is actually much worse. So we're likely underestimating this. Um, you can move to the next slide. Now, grain estimates, uh, the NGO grain estimates that the expanded trade through the FTA for eight agricultural products will result in a 34% increase in emissions. Um, but what I wanted to bring a moment to talk about is the incentivization through this FTA, the political signal that it gives, and the economic consequences, of course, but, uh, but mainly what is the impact on the social and environmental um, uh, destructive land use change? and edging the Amazon further towards its tipping point. Now, I drew those little red lines in the slide, so it's not an accurate uh, description. Uh, you see the Amazon basin, and, um, and then you see these red lines, the ones that is circling Bolivia, uh, Argentina, and Paraguay is the Gran Chaco, and then that funny shape towards the right is the Cerrado, and I, the Cerrado is bigger than what I've um, done here. But the bottom line is that these three ecosystems are, are not only of um, central importance to regulate the climate, not just for the world, but also for the Mercosur countries themselves, but they are also enormous value um, for biodiversity. And what we see it, uh, resulting from these expanded quotas, um, the signal that it gives um, to increase meat production, to therefore increase soy production. Uh, um, we're gonna see an expanded uh, increase in even corn production in the Cerrado because um, increasingly more and more corn is being used to, um, to um, uh, provide ethanol. Uh, the US Department of Agriculture estimates that Brazil's expansion of corn production will result in more corn planted in the Cerrado so even though it's a, it's a second crop usually planted, the acreage is expanding and uh, Mato Grosso and several other regions are expected to expand production in the range of 20 to 40% by the end of this decade. So exacerbating land use change and deforestation. Um, next slide. So this shows you the extent um, of the EU's responsibility uh, in all of this. Um, a study that came out looked at uh, between 2013 and 2017 how much of the um, embedded deforestation is, is in soy imports. And you can see that for the EU, it estimates 16% um, of the volume of, of soy came from a region with 85% deforestation risk. Um, you can see that that's the Mato Piba region in, in the Cerrado. Um, and with Germany, it was 32% of all soy imports. There are other studies, actually, um, peer-reviewed studies that are showing that as much as half 
um, 47% uh, um, of, of uh, they found that nearly half of all beef exports to the EU may have been obtained through illegal deforestation. So um, this next slide, please. Uh, this, I wanted to, there's a section in the fact sheet that talks about traceability and, um, you know, could we make this agreement better through uh, strict restrictions? Currently, um, environmental and social provisions are in an unenforceable um, uh, sustainable development chapter. So as it stands, definitely not. But there's a critical issue here about whether um, these supply chains can be made sustainable. This is a, a study we did with grain a few years ago where we estimated uh, emissions of, of companies. And you can see JBS, Marfrig, BRF um, there. Uh, these are all uh, companies that are exporting from the Mercosur region into the EU and globally, they, these are global giants. And the yellow is what they were reporting as their emissions. And the blue is what we calculated using the FAO's methodology for calculating their emissions. So it's a pretty significant um, deviation. Next um, slide. And uh, yeah, there's been a lot of academic literature that is looking at how deforestation has continued in spite of the soy moratorium, in spite of the um, the cattle uh, agreement that will that they will not be um, uh, deforesting, and this is a an academic study that tracked where the deforestation was happening in light of where the agreements were created. Sec next slide. And this is uh, one of the ways that it happens, right? You uh, take um, cattle from an illegal area and you bring it into um, either slaughterhouses that are certified, uh, so you launder it or you shift, um, basically it moves into other areas. And so if there's leakage, um, you know, where you're uh, continuing to deforest. Uh, next slide. So anyway, this and more in the climate fact sheet, but uh, I'll move on to the next one, which is uh, food safety. So, um, one of the key things about the food safety uh, issue is that the, the sanitary and phytosanitary chapter of the EU Mercosur deal has no uh, precautionary principle in it. So that means that standards uh, needn't be based on prevention principles, but rather a weaker WTO risk assessment. Um, so CODIS elementarius guidance, for instance, allows much higher pesticide residue on foods than EU standards including for the highest hazard chemicals. And Codex is the base, the standard that the WTO uses. Next. So the EU and Mercosur cannot rely on the precautionary principle to preventatively block imports of agriculture goods suspected of pathogen contamination or prohibited pesticide residues. That's one of the, the threats that we see. Next. And we believe that the chapter also weakens oversight of imported food products and increases po potentially the risk to consumers. So it limits food safety inspections, it streamlines approval of meat exports, rapidly pre-approving increased meat exports, um, reducing the frequency and effectiveness of food safety checks by the importing country, limiting the authority of governments to preventatively block imports when food safety violations are suspected. Next. So this uh, image on the side is uh, Acarne e Flaca for uh, the Portuguese allies. Um, in 2017, there was a, a, an a government, Brazilian government operation called Operation Weak Flesh, which exposed um, a huge scandal for those companies that I mentioned in the previous slide on climate, um, where they were exporting a large amount of rotting meat. And there were several bans from different countries, including the EU. And um, what we're basically saying is uh, that on both sides, in the EU and the Mercosur countries, food safety uh, measures need to be strengthened. And even in the EU, it's a challenging scenario. And what this um, deal does is actually it weakens um, inspections and it and expedites uh, the trade of, of meat and other products and therefore endangers um, consumers in the process. Next. 
Oh, and then this is, uh, yep, so the, and then the whole fact sheet is about. Agora, temos aqui. So a public procurement um, agreement within this uh, trade deal. And basically public procurement in Mercosur countries um, provides and has provided several functions. It helps uh, reduce hunger. So child meals, school feeding programs. Next slide. And it supports family farmers and local economies. Next. But the draft text uh, bans local hiring and development. So we're talking about food, medicines, infrastructure projects um, that cannot be biased towards local production. Um, text on offsets prohibits governments from insisting on measures used to encourage local development or domestic content. And it appears to main, though it appears to mainly bind federal spending, it paves the way to bind states and municipalities even after the agreement has been completed. So basically what we're saying is that um, it advantages, this is a strong EU interest. They're interested in contracts to, to, to do government procurement within the Mercosur area. This is uh, an area where they're very competitive, but this is an, a very critical development tool for many countries, including Mercosur countries. And we see that as undermining um, uh, core, core goals for public health and food security. Next. It also increases the pressure to join a controversial uh, WTO government procurement agreement. So right now there's a plurilateral government procurement agreement and Brazil has recently expressed its interest in joining this uh, GPA and almost certainly along the lines of the EU Mercosur FTA. So you can see that it's creating a kind of a momentum towards, uh, yeah, the, the non-discrimination principle in this case is, is basically treating small and big the same and not discriminating against each other. And that's what is the most problematic aspect of this agreement. And you can see that uh, through CETA, um, Canadian analysts have found that the, the, those rules prohibit favoring local content or suppliers for a wide range of subcentral entities. So this non-discrimination and uh, unconditional access to Canadian markets by large cor EU corporations. Next. Um, I didn't have a little uh, flash for the pesticides, and this is the final uh, fact sheet that we have, which is um, the agreement also reduces or eliminates over 90% of existing tariffs on chemicals, um, pesticides that are exported into Mercosur. So it's, it's not a complete image of the graphic, but uh, it shows you how many uh, pesticides are approved in Brazil, a, a large number. and um, the percentage of which is not approved in the EU. So you can see like 47 out of the 160 are not approved in the EU, but exported. Um, the tariffs will also be reduced for products grown with dangerous pesticides. So we talked about these eight agricultural commodities that are gonna be um, uh, increasing their quotas, but also there's a lot of um, tariffs um, that are just slashed through the deal. So it increases, um, imports of, of agriculture crops laden with pesticides. Next. And that uh, risks increasing pesticide linked human rights abuses. Um, I looked for images and they're just too depressing and horrific. So here's an example of um, the, the EU countries and the, the tons of uh, pesticides that are being exported to the Mercosur countries. Next. Uh, the dialogues chapter of the FDA specifically calls for talks to harmonize GMO regulations. So uh, this increases the pressure regulators um, um, face to speed up approvals of genetically modified pesticide dependent crops and expand their cultivation. It also increases economic harm to the organic and agroecological farming sector in Mercosur countries while undermining next generation food, environmental and public health policy in both the EU and Mercosur. There's a, a vibrant movement on both sides to expand agroecology and um, turn back, um, you know, away from industrial agriculture. And these kinds of uh, regulations and uh, regulatory cooperation actually undermines those efforts. Um, 
pesticide corporations and trade partners are pressuring EU to allow banned substances in imported crops. So the FDA adds to that pressure and it also undermines uh, the EU's farm to fork strategy. Thanks. So I leave you with this, this image that I really like of the Amazon basin, but the tributaries that flow into the whole region and how critical, uh, we're in a critical moment in history. Um, uh, I, we blew past that tipping point uh, slide, but really a few years ago, um, the scientists said that um, the, the Amazon may reach a tipping point between 17 to, uh, if 17 to 20% of the basin is, uh, uh, deforested. And we've reached, no, sorry, uh, 17 to 20% of the basin has already been deforested. And we think, they think that the tipping point might be between 20 and 25%. So they advise that let's not find out exactly what percentage we hit the tipping point. Let's try do our best to avoid that. And that's critical for the whole, whole world, but next slide. But it's also especially critical for the Mercosur region because as you saw the tributaries, if these water cycles are disrupted, um, the region faces severe drought um, and hardship. And so we should all be cognizant about whether such a deal will help further development goals and environmental and social goals or undermine them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shefali, for this um, presentation. And I realized that it has gotten dark outside. So now I'm very bright, but um, I will try to fix that um, very soon. Um, so as you, yes, as you saw, these um, fact sheets are very helpful to understand different aspects of that uh, trade agreement. There are four of them on climate and land use, pesticide and GMOs, food safety, food safety and on public procurement. And two of them are um, already online and two uh, more are going to follow either tonight or tomorrow. So stay tuned. We put the link in the chat so that you can all, all, all already download the first two. Um, and we will now move forward with um, the first comment on these fact sheets by Anna Cavazzini, who I now um, ask to, to come up on stage. Um, she is a German politician who has been a member of the European Parliament since 2019. And as such, she has served as the chair of the Committee on the Internet, Internal Market and Consumer Protection. She's also a deputy member of the Committee on International Trade and a vice, the vice president of the delegation of the European Parliament to Brazil. So uh, three different functions, three different roles um, via vi which she has really gained um, expertise um, on the EU Mercosur agreement. So please, Anna, tell us more about where we are at with regards to the political process. What are the major concerns from your side? Um, what are attempts to overcome them, both concerning the Mercosur agreement itself, but also other initiatives that you have followed, um, such as due diligence legislation? Um, please, Anna, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you so much for the presentation and also for the invitation. Um, first of all, I think it's great um, that the Hannes Böll Foundation comes up with these fact sheets because we can always note that it is so hard to get um, the trade debate really to the public because it's very technical at some point. It's really often hard to understand. And I think that is why yeah, events like this, but especially also yeah, scientific publication, fact sheets, um, to get um, the people understand uh, what it's all about is really crucial. So thank you so much for that. And I think also with these fact sheets, you really um, touched upon the most um, important problems that we as the Green Group in the European Parliament, but of course also other groups and NGOs and so on and, and scholars have identified as criticism when it comes to um, the Mercosur Agreement. Um, it is very funny, I, um, the French delegation or some French colleagues of mine had shared a video recently about um, past debates in the European Parliament and the Greens have been always at the forefront, even already, I don't know, 2007 or 2003, they had been already, as you know, it was negotiated for 20 years, the Greens had made some noise about the agreement, but of course only with the kind of finalization last year in July uh, the topic became really uh, more persistent uh, here in the debate. And at the beginning, I would say we also felt a little bit alone as Greens um, with our criticism. 
but um, yeah, because I would say also the environmental destruction that is happening every day and the, polic the policy of Bolsonaro, um, the debate changed a little bit. So um, that is why um, probably you have heard that um, in September or October, I think it was in October, the European Parliament for the first time um, adopted an amendment in plenary saying that like this, like it stands, we will not ratify the Mercosur agreement. And um, probably for some, it came a little bit out of the blue, but I would say it was for me and a lot of other colleagues really a lot of uh, basically work la the last one and a half years to to really um, have try to have critical debates in the parliament to make um, a lot of uh, publicity on the problems we see. And I said they correspond really with your fact sheets and to make other colleagues in the parliament aware of the problems. Um, and of course, as you can imagine, it's first and foremost the environment debate, but there is also colleagues who have, um, let's say agriculture constituencies and who are worried about um, their farmers who suffer already from low prices when it comes, for example, to beef. Um, having even more uh, com competition and more pressure. So um, with this, now the European Parliament has um, a firm stance on, on the Mercosur agreement, and this is, this is quite good. It is not a legally binding decision. It was like a political resolution. Um, so we didn't like reject the agreement as such, as some media uh, put in their headlines. Um, but of course, it's a very strong political signal. And at the same time, you have probably seen that also in the council, like a lot of member states, even more and more every month, you have the feeling another member state is coming uh, and joins the club, um, also raised their, their critical, critical voices or said like this, they don't want to ratify the agreement. And again, they have different reasons. I think for a lot of them, it's public pressure. And again, it shows public pressure is crucial. It's helping. It's really... Um, something that we need without it, it, it cannot it cannot work that we get politics uh, changing. So um, in a lot of member states, public pressure help. But again, also, I would say um, the agricultural community probably played also a role in, in putting pressure on, on some member states. So um, we are um, at the situation that in the council, you need anonymity and it's not given because you have critical member states. We have the critical European Parliament and then finally, um, after also really, I had the feeling talking one and a half years since my election against a wall with the commission and always the commission saying, yeah, no, no, there's no problems. And with the agreement, um, we even have a better leverage to influence Bolsonaro, so we need the agreement. Um, after, yeah, uh, not so much reaction, the first one and a half years, we finally also got um, an official statement by um, the new trade commissioner um, Dombrovskis in the hearing where he was actually basically appointed after um, Phil Hogan left. Um, and we, he responded to my question with the same line like this, the Mercosur agreement cannot be ratified. And this is of course now an interesting situation because we are a little bit in this uh, moment where, um, yeah, this is already a big, big, big step. It's already a victory basically of the movement of environmental NGOs, of the Greens, of a lot of people, also of course social democrats and like other other groups. I don't want to forget anybody, but like it's a victory of a common um, pressure. But on the other hand, um, we should be very very careful to at the moment and now not fall in this um, trap that we saw in the past with CETA, with the agreement uh, with Canada, and also with other agreements that. Yeah, we will probably have minor changes or yeah, not even binding changes. And then at the end, um, most of the parliamentarians and member states will be like, yeah, okay, now it's fine, we can vote in favor. So I think we're now at the moment where pressure even needs to be increased. So we cannot lean back and say, okay, now the parliament has, um, has adopted this amendment. So now we can like relax, it's all good. I think now the pressure um, needs, to, needs to be increased even for really getting um, a meaning or meaningful change in, in the agreement and for really getting also meaningful change in EU trade policy overall. Because what I want to stress, and this is really, really important for me, Mercosur, the Mercosur agreement is only one 
one agreement. Yeah, it's a big one. It's a, a one with a lot of problems, but we can see similar patterns in, in other agreements that the European Union is negotiating at the moment. And, and that is why, and, and all of those agreements that don't um, attract any public attention. And I understand it a little bit because also you cannot have so much public attention on probably 40 trade agreements we're negotiating. But that is why I think we should use the attention that the Mercosur agreement has in order to also extend um, basically um, to other agreements and make a general point on what is going wrong at the moment in new trade policy. And this is what we're trying really to do every day in the parliament, trying to have structural changes in new trade policy. So not only having cosmetic changes at the Mercosur agreement, but really having something um, bigger going on. And in general, I would say the rhetorics is there. And that is quite interesting because as you know, the big um, project of this EU commission and basically also endorsed by the parliament and by the council is the EU Green Deal. And we have been asking from the beginning, how can we have a Green Deal and trying to really transform our economies in Europe, making them CO2 neutral, if we don't change anything, anything, anything in our trade policy. Um, and I think this narrative is slowly, slowly arriving in the, let's say, in the mainstream here in Brussels, which is um, quite good. Um, I also always try to explain, and this is, I mean, um, yeah, I think Shefali knows very well about that. Trade rules are so important because they, they cement, they put the international economic system like in cement and make it like very, very hard to change anything afterwards. Take, for example, the Energy Charter Treaty at the moment. It's just an example. It's a very dangerous um, investment protection treaty that makes it very hard um, to um, have the energy transition going and not fossil fuel investors suing states because they do the, um, the um, energy transition and uh, go away from fossil fuel. And it's so hard to reform because it's anonymity, this whole treaty. Or you have, if you leave, a sunset clause of 20 years. And this is just an example that shows how much, how important it is that those international trade and investment rules are right. Because otherwise they are really there and they determine our national politics. And this is, this is their goal. This is their philosophy. This is why they're put in place. Because of course, they want to give like a, a framework for the international economy. But this is why we have to change them because the blueprint for those international agreements, they're like from the 90s or even earlier when we were not aware about the climate crisis yet or few people were <laughs> um, and we were not aware of the sustainability crisis. So we need to change international trade rules. Mercosur is a very good showcase. Um, we have the narrative arriving in the mainstream here. Um, the commission even now started an official procedure of reviewing the EU trade policy and um, stakeholders and also us Greens and also even the whole parliament have put input to the commission of how the EU trade policy should be reformed. And the commission will come up with a communication um, at the beginning of next year. Um, and we are really hoping and pushing that we will see some structural changes. Um, last point on the Mercosur agreement very quickly, I think, um, what is important now for the way forward is that we don't have, as I said, cosmetic changes, just having some action plan on deforestation. This will clearly be not enough. Um, and I, I voiced this concern several times with, with the commission and also with fellow MEPs. Um, there need to be really enforceable um, commitments um, against um, deforestation. This is very important on this like bilateral or like agreement um, level. And on the other hand, we also need EU unilateral measures. And there, there are some interesting initiatives coming. For example, um, someone mentioned it at the beginning, um, we will have a mandatory due diligence legislation um, coming out next year. And of course, we Greens want to make it as like enforceable and binding and effective as possible. And we will also have um, new legislation, especially when it comes to due diligence and deforestation. So how do we really get deforestation free supply chains? And uh, we will have a review of the timber regulation that also looks at illegal deforestation. So 
There's like unilateral measures by the EU where we need to push. And there's also the question, what do we put in the Mercosur agreement to make it better? And don't um, let ourselves fool from just cosmetic changes that will not really at the end um, have any effect. So um, I'm looking forward to the discussion and um, thanks again for the invitation. Thank you very much, um, Anna, for these insights um, from the European Parliament. And I think you've already um, kind of opened up the debate um, about the larger discussion that we need to have, how we can make trade policy fit for the challenges of the 21st century. But um, coming back to the challenges outlined um, within the fact sheets, um, especially with respect to people on the ground, we will now have uh, Maureen Santos from FASI speaking to us. Um, she is the coordinator of the National Advisor Group at FASE, so that is the Federation of Organs for Social and Educational Assistance. Um, and she will yeah, tell us more about the, the view of the civil society in Brazil, and um, what she thinks about the, the four them thematic fact sheets um, and how yeah, people feel about that. Um, for those of you who do not speak Portuguese, please make sure that you choose the right channel um, to ha have the simultaneous translation. So please, Maureen, the floor is yours. Thank you. Obrigada, Lisa. Well, thank you very much, uh, Liz. It's a great pleasure to be here uh, with you. Uh, thank you for the invitation, uh, not just the HBS from Brussels, and for the launch of these fact sheets, which are very important uh, to uh, uh, show the possible impacts. Uh, I think uh, Shefalia made a wonderful presentation in such short time, and that's good. And so, uh, and thank Sharon and Karen as well to be able to be here together and because they are our co-authors of, uh, of these materials, of these fact sheets. And this demonstrates in Brazil that we should believe in these uh, studies and, uh, and tells us uh, how difficult is the situation already right now, uh, especially since uh, Bolsonaro took power. And this will have more impacts, not just uh, after following the pandemic, but also the signing of uh, this uh, agreement or the enforcement of it. So we have several uh, elements from fact sheets, the reinforcement and raise vectors of uh, deforestation of uh, Amazonia, uh, and the, the, the link that it has with all those who are meat producers, for example, the big companies, uh, and this, this is a total uncontrolled evolution of the situation. And of course, uh, we have a, speci a speci special institute who has been <clears throat> publishing some photos that prove that the deforestation is uh, rising. And we have to think ways, technolog technological ways that will be an answer through traceability. And we are very concerned uh, with all these technologies um, that can help us. Uh, we, we know that certain institutes, public institutes, have been run down by the present uh, administration. And we need those, uh, those institutes to be able to prove our case in terms of uh, uh, registration of the, the territories, registration of animals. And these institutes already have technical uh, documents, publications that demonstrate all the failures in this, all this process. So we have in front of us a big challenge. Uh, not only the, for concerning the soya production, but also the meat production and the destruction of the Cerrado and the Mato Piba. So not just one challenge, but several challenges. And Shefalia, within the, the agrotoxics, you showed us a graphic which is very important for us to understand the role of the, of the chemical industry in Europe, a pressure so that the, 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 the agreement is signed very quickly because there are big interests, because there are very many of those active ingredients come from uh, European companies. And they are actually some of those ingredients are banned 
in the European Union market, but they are not banned over here. And so I like that graphic, uh, Shefali. Uh, <clears throat> and I think my time is uh, almost over. I don't know if I can still have time to uh, mention two other items. Well, the lack of this uh, prevention, uh, the precaution of prevention uh, clause. This is present in all the debates that we have because we think it's very important. Within the sanitary and phytosanitary measures, we have to have a prevention system. It otherwise, we'll have more danger, more risks for the populations, but also for the European Union populations because we will have double standards in acting of the companies the types of products that can be sold in the north and types of products that can be sold in the south. And, of course, this way, if uh, the big companies go ahead, the European Union countries will be accepting consuming uh, products which are banned uh, in, in the European Union itself. And this is uh, what I had to say concerning procurement. In your scenario that you mentioned, Shafali, Right now, with this present economic crisis, with impoverishing of the population, uh, more hunger in Brazil, it's a, a lot more complex to liberalize <clears throat> the public procurement, which are, have a big impact to fight, uh, for example, the pandemic, uh, the fight against unemployment. So we are very concerned, we, civil society, to liberalize the resources for 1 billion, this is what we asked. To only 500 million were liberated <clears throat> to fight against uh, uh, hunger, to, to, uh, to, to help the schools, to help uh, the, those in rural areas and to help those uh, women in rural areas because those are the biggest group who gets those funds. So I'd just like to mention also this point because it's very important to, <clears throat> to think about public procurement that will have an impact, uh, an impact in, in everyday life for the Thank you so much. Um, and I see that a lot of questions are coming in and we are running out of time, so I will be very short. Um, our uh, last panelist that I will introduce is Jan Laurent. He is the Biodiversity and Ecosystems Program Director at IDRI, which is an independent policy research institute and multi-stakeholder dialogue platform based in Paris. And he has worked on globalized value chains and the fight against deforestation. And he is also um, a member of a commission of independent experts that produced an impact study um, of that deal for the French government. And it basically blasted the, the accord as a missed opportunity. And Brazil, um, Brazilian press argued that the report showed the true protectionist interests of those who commissioned it. So um, Jan, I would be very interested in hearing more about your insights. Um, so please go ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you all for this invitation. Um, I'd, I'd like I try to be quick and, of course, not repeat what has been uh, uh, said before. Um, from what we saw from from now on, you can you can figure out that there are three ba major ways to somehow to um, to improve a, a, a free trade agreement. Um, uh, first first way is to um, to to add something in the deal itself. Uh, and today, the deal, the way it's, it's, it's drafted is, as it's, it was said by, by Shefali and others, uh, is not adequate to uh, actually ensure sustainable development. Second way is to um, make sure that the producers that are uh, concerned and involved in the, uh, in the trade that's going to be increased by the uh, trade agreements are actually following uh, best practices, let's say. And, and we've considered meat, for example, and beef meats. Um, it relates 
to traceability and to sanitary uh, measures, for example. Third way is on is about regulation. I mean, uh, national domestic regulation on both sides, uh, in that case of the Atlantic. That is, how do we implement the forest record in Brazil or in the environmental law in, in Argentina, for example, and how does um, the EU regulate its use of products, agricultural products, with respect to their uh, environmental impacts, not only in the Amazon, but everywhere in the world, including in the, in the EU itself. So um, first, uh, of course, um, to improve the deal today, uh, of, the best would be, uh, of course, to have sustainable development clauses, provisions, all throughout the deal, throughout the draft, uh, which uh, uh, and not only on the trade and sustainable development chapter, which is a very good instrument for countries that are willing to co cooperate for for more sustainable development. But when it's not the case, when the when you don't have a full goodwill, then a trade and sustainable development chapter, as it stands, is 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 rather weak. So uh, we will need to have provisions like climate and biodiversity provisions, for example, throughout the deal or sanitary provisions throughout the deal. So, second, of course, and that's probably um, one way of improving the deal that's possible today, is is about adding some commitments from the parties uh, in the deal um, that will that will actually address the main concerns that you have risen, uh, Shefali and uh, Anna and, and others. Um, third way is to ask uh, for some preliminary conditions before it ratifying. For example, saying we would consider ratifying after some policies changed has been seen on the ground, that we have seen some change in the current uh, policy with respect to uh, Amazon, Cerrado, the Gran Chaco, and the, and the people that live here. Um, uh, and possibly, why not, uh, also changes in the European policy uh, uh, with respect to, to, to this issue. So that's, that's the th third way to do it. Fourth way is to, um, to have an agreement on implementing best practices, for example, for, again, for, from the meat exporters, um, how to implement um, the full traceability from the birth of the, of the cattle to to its uh, slaughter, which is not the case today, except in Uruguay, uh, in Mercosur, whereas it's the case in the uh, EU, of course. And then the last one is, of course, about regulating, reg regulating um, the, um, uh, the, uh, the, the, the agricultural and other productions with respect to their environmental uh, impact. So uh, what would a sustainable development policy, uh, trade and sustainable development policy, let's say, would look like? How, 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 what, what would it look like? Um, first, uh, in my view, um, we should stop uh, counting on mult existing multilateral, multilateral uh, environmental agreements, like saying we will refer to the Paris Agreement on Climate Change uh, and everyone is committed uh, to, to uh, respecting this, uh, this agreement, because these agreements are not made for trade disputes. Um, and they are not, uh, uh, they, they are clauses, their provisions are not suitable for trade disputes. So we need some, some day to have our own uh, climate, biodiversity, human rights, uh, you name it, clauses within the agreement instead of referring to external um, multilateral environmental agreements uh, uh, clauses. That's one way of thinking of things. And, and second, shift from a sanction. I've seen, I've seen a question about that, shift from a based uh, reasoning to an indicator and, and condition-based reasoning. That is, sanctions in the case of trade and sustainable development are very difficult impl to implement because, and that's normal, you need, if you want um, to get into any dispute resolution, you need to prove that the, 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 the fact that your, um, uh, your partner in, in trade has not respected a sustainable development clause has caused you a prejudice. Uh, uh, um, uh, harm, uh, uh, harm, an economic harm, and you have to prove this uh, to actually um, make a sanction applicable, which is very difficult. So the best might be to rather uh, base the, um, the 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 trade agreement itself on environmental and and, and human rights and civil rights indicators, as uh, from a priori indicators, not not a, a, a posteriori uh, sanctions. Um, 
think also of one uh, instrument that would that are the investment agreements today they are very uh, controversial they are seen as a way to protect the interests of the multilateral uh, uh, multinational companies only but one could think of investment agreements as a as a means to actually uh, enhance cooperation between the regions we you brazil argentina uh, uh, mercosur countries will need investments to uh, to help their um, their uh, uh, environmental transition, let's say, and there might be something thought in, in in that case to help to support with investments to support this transition. So investment agreement might be something else than protecting the um, the, in the investors' interest, but also to try and cooperate more in in that respect. Uh, and and last, of course, um, a, a trade agreement can be something interesting uh, to support the civil society, the organizations in 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 the countries um, in in their efforts to. Um, to actually uh, uh, improve the, 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 the policy. So why, why keep, I, I think the, the, uh, everyone has said the, uh, the, the Mercosur deal is not acceptable as it stands. Everyone said so, and I think that's very important to keep the door open. Because if we just say, we don't want any deal, then what happens? It's not that we are going to quit doing trade with the people that we are tra trading with. It's just that we are going back to the WTO rules. Um, it doesn't mean that we are not, we are going to stop globalization. It's just that we are not, we are going to lose a means to actually cooperate and discuss about rules. So I think, um, and, and trade policy is mostly for, for, for the EU is mostly dependent on the, on the new free trade agreements. So these free trade agreements are the actual means to change something in the, in the, in the current situation and in the trade uh, situation. So they are very in interesting instruments and not to be um, uh, just uh, discarded and suppressed, I, in my view. Of course, they have to be very strongly improved. Uh, uh, and um, remember that um, trade agreements today are somehow the only, uh, or at least the most important diplomatic power of the European Union. You know that the EU is weak in terms of diplomatic action, but it's strong in, in terms of economic market and access to its market is its only external policy strength. So dealing with this and, and making uh, uh, thinking of uh, how can we um, uh, let's say, uh, uh, let's, uh, how can we favor, enhance sustainable development and the Green Deal with the cooperation across uh, across all countries, um, based uh, and using trade as an instrument, uh, not as an, as, an, as an obstacle, could be a good way to do uh, su such things. And of course, um, I've, what I've heard from from many Brazilian civil society organizations is that they need. Um, the support from the uh, European Parliament, the uh, European CSOs, and all uh, in 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 negotiating uh, a better deal, rather than saying we don't want the deal, uh, because again that would give them some kind of leverage uh, 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 internally for their domestic policy. I think that's all I have to add to for, for now, and of course I'm ready for discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jan, for your insights. I would now like to ask all panelists to switch on their cameras again for um, a very short panel discussion because we are running out of time. Um, you asked many questions, so thank you, um, dear participants, for being so active. And it is very hard to summarize them, um, but quite a few of them were actually about these, um, as you called it, um, Jan, the diplomatic power and geopolitical aspects about the um, uh, regional comprehensive uh, free trade agreement in, in Asia. So um, what are your arguments with respect to uh, yeah, this, this geopolitical, these geopolitical aspects of the agreement? Um, and where, yeah, how, how can we improve trade policies uh, and still take into account all these realist arguments of international relations? And maybe um, Shifali, you go first and then Anna. And please go ahead, go ahead and also look at, uh, at the questions and keep them in mind when answering. Uh, there, uh, thank you so much. Uh, thanks to everybody. And yes, I want to acknowledge my colleagues, Karen Hansen-Kuhn and Sharon Treat. Uh, you can see Karen, can't see Sharon, but um, 
they were the ones who did the government procurement. Um, Karen did that and Sharon did the one on food safety and pesticides. So I did them the injustice of speaking on their behalf for a very short presentation, but they're here to answer questions now. Um, I would just uh, comment on what uh, sustainable development or environmental clauses dispersed through this trade agreement would mean. Um, yes, land use change and climate issues are critical. Human rights issues are very critical. I think that there's a lot of work to be done for me to be convinced that that would be an approach that would work now. Because as Anna put it, and I totally agree. I think you have to change the model of the trade agreement itself. You can't have on the one hand, a whole principle where deregulation is the fundamental aim of the agreement, where market access is the fundamental aim of the agreement. And then say, but let's try to make it nice and better. Um, I mean, the government procurement and maybe Karen can come in there is a, is a case in point. What is the idea behind non-discrimination in a free trade agreement? It basically means big and small should be treated equally. And that for the 21st century, and it didn't make sense in the 20th century either, but even more so now that we've hit our planetary boundaries, it makes even less sense. So I think, yes, you could patch it up with different things. And by all means, if in the absence of any choice, we have to demand conditionalities, but would the end result be fundamentally different unless we change the model of the agreement itself? I don't think so. And at least many of us don't believe that without fundamental changes to that, that the end result is gonna be that different. Anna, maybe you can add some, um, some political points as well uh, with regards to ongoing negotiations and what kind of, yeah, what, what ways out do you see what are yours? What is your stance? Yeah, thank you so much. I also tried to um, answer some of the questions in writing, but the ones I couldn't answer, I can probably quickly touch upon now. Um, because there were two questions on the RCEP, like this regional trade agreement in Asia, and one I typed already and probably to the other quickly, uh, and Shefali had also made the point. I feel a little bit that some people getting nervous here, and especially like let's say the right side of the parliament tries to use this um, successful agreement uh, in Asia, uh, in that region between Asian countries, ASEAN countries and some other countries as um, a kind of a tool or like a leverage on us and saying, okay, we should um, basically um, give up our resistance towards the Mercosur agreement because if we're not um, fast enough and uh, do all of that, then China will take over. But I don't really agree with this argument because um, if you really look at the history of the RCEP and also if you look at how it is shaped at the, at the beginning, at the moment, it is not really what um, everyone uh, is thinking. So it was not initiated by China uh, to take over the region. It was actually the other Asian, ASEAN countries trying to get market, market access to China and they involve China. And also it is not very deep. It's mainly it, in, in so many areas, it doesn't go beyond WTO. So it's basically tariff reduction. I mean, there's also other things involved, but it's not the same, let's say, deep and comprehensive trade agreements that the EU is doing. Um, and also third, thirdly, I mean, the EU is a regional trade agreement as well. It's not a trade agreement, but it's, it's about regional trade. And I think the EU should in general also foster regional integration. I think that makes completely sense that you have a better integration, for example, in Africa and not having individual economic partnership agreements with the EU, but having more like an, an African um, free trade zone or whatsoever. So I think the regional integration should be something that we um, as European Union support. So yeah, I don't understand the panic with the RCEP so much. Very quickly, there was a question on, on Uruguay and uh, Mr. Dombrovskis, the trade commissioner, just having met with Uruguay on pre ratification commitments. We haven't gotten any debrief so far, but we had debriefs by the commission before that meeting when uh, Dombrovskis met with the uh, Brazilian foreign minister. And to our knowledge, there was not yet any specific outcomes of those talks or they haven't informed the parliament, but I don't know of any specific outcomes. They just also informed us that there are these talks about pre-ratification commitments, but also about 
adding stuff in the agreement, like a protocol or something, but we don't know the details. Um, and then last thing very quickly on um, the WTO, there was a question on the WTO. Um, and indeed, um, it's interesting also for us, and I would really be curious what Shefali says, because we had been very critical of the WTO often in the past, and now it's basically the only multilateral forum left. So we changed a little bit our attitude, attitude towards the WTO. I mean, still criticizing some of the rules, but saying, okay, at least we should not completely dump it, because at least it's the last multilateral forum. Um, we try to also push the Commission in getting a WTO reform going towards more sustainability. And what is very good, um, Commissioner Dombrovskis in this hearing that I mentioned already announced um, a climate and trade initiative at the WTO. But we have still to find out exactly what it is, because it cannot only be about liberalization of environmental friendly goods. It has to be also something more meaningful. Um, but at least now the Commission takes up this reform need of the WTO and tries to connect it with sustainability. But I think, to be very honest, the WTO will be very difficult to reform. Thank you, Anna. And yes, I think um, that opens up a whole new debate and we could uh, definitely have another um, debate and round table on uh, the, the broader question of sustainable trade policy, WTA reform, etc. cetera. Um, before we close, I would like to give the floor again to Maureen and also to Jan at the end. So sorry for running a little bit late. Um, Maureen, first of all, I would like to give you the um, opportunity to react to whatever you have heard. Plus, there is one question um, of Laura Keor, um, where she basically says that um, indigenous leader uh, Sonia Guaraya suggests two clear benchmarks of progress that should be met before considering ratifying any new trade deals. So I don't know if you have that in front of you and also participants that are still in. Um, you are still over 100. Um, so please have a look at that question and um, please, Maureen, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Oh, so. é, obrigada, Elisa. E eu acho que tem uma questão que foi colocada, só que eu não estou conseguindo mais ver aqui, que eu acho que dá para fazer um paralelo junto com a questão da Laura. I é, can't da... see the question on the chat about the position of the indigenous population in Brazil. Oh, it's in the, about in the, this agreement. It's in the questions and answers section, but I yeah, it's also it's in the, the it's in the chat. Yeah, in the question and answers. And another question was also related to that. It's true. Now, sustainable development chapter with climate change. The way in which they are presented, they're not part of the main body of text. And they mention uh, or they make reference to the Paris uh, Climate Treaty and the first results will only come in uh, the next few years with um, the development goals and these development goals are still very fragile in relation to our global objective of only increasing one and a half degrees Celsius in global temperature. So we need other measures to strengthen the multilateral activities, biodiversity, and it's not to look just at the climate, but other areas of multilateral interest. So there's a, so having reached an agreement in trade terms, we still have to look at the other issues and that comment which you made is fundamental. And conflicts in Brazil, but also conflicts in Paraguay and in the Ganchaco region, this discussion is taking place on uh, the large cattle farms on the land in these countries. This is a big issue and and it has to be looked at in detail and has to be part of the debate and what liberalization will mean. And that was linked to other questions. And all these issues, it's better to have an agreement and we have 
we have a large group against the agreement but the way the way in which it is drafted at the moment for us it's better not to have an agreement thank you thank you for that uh, powerful statement um jan would you like to react to that um you have already provided some arguments in your first intervention but maybe to what has been said ever since Yes, and, and I'd like to reflect as well on some of the, on some of the QRL that have been uh, said. Um, definitely, it's, it's certain that the best way to use this uh, moment, this political moment, would be to uh, somehow uh, force a change in the current uh, uh, deforestation policy in the Mercosur as a precondition for ratifying. That's what the um, uh, some of the strong CSOs in Brazil are asking for. And I think it would be definitely the, the, the best way, of course. Uh, and the, let's say the ideal, the ideal uh, means to, to use any trade, um, trade agreement, uh, um, again, by, by using and by asking for strong preliminary conditions. That will, uh, however, be rather difficult to have, of course, as you, as you can understand, because that would mean a real uh, a turn, 180 degrees to turn in the, in the current policy, and it will be difficult to have it only based on the, um, on the attractivity of the EU market, which is now by far not the first in, in the uh, first buyer of the Brazilian or Argentinian uh, soy or, or beef or, or you name it. Um, we are the, at least the second and sometimes the third, um, right, way, way, way after the Chinese uh, in, in that case. Uh, and second, uh, what is important as well is that we need to think of, of a compromise we have to do. Um, trade policy is not, uh, unfortunately, is not made only for, uh, for, for advancing the sustainable development agenda. Trade policy historically has been made to, to enhance growth and to provide jobs market shares and um, however we would like things to be different and I would like things to be different um, uh, they are not yet uh, or at least not fully uh, some uh, many parts of the European powers and opinions and parties and of the Mercosurian parties are more in favor of jobs and growth than 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 uh, of, of sustainable development so trade policy is still going to be somehow uh, uh, de defined and designed based on the uh, on the on the on the on the on the growth and, and jobs. Uh, so, so we have to find a compromise. And a way to, to, to find um, a compromise is, of course, to try and again and use the leverage that's, um, that, that's contained in a, in a free trade agreement to actually have uh, an improvement in the, in the situation. And, and last thing I'd like to comment on, because it hasn't been a question, but it should be, is, is this protectionism. Um, protectionism uh, question. Of course, it is true that the European position is a mixture uh, of, uh, of, of care for the environmental, for, for the envir environment, for the indigenous people, and for protecting the farmers, uh, European farmers, against co uh, international competition, even more uh, when farmers are actually going by strict rules uh, of, uh, of environmental rules. And so um, we have to deal with this and to work with this. And what is also very important to hear is maybe, um, uh, I, I hope that today or tomorrow, the, the, the CSOs in the Mercosur will be able to tell, to, to give us th their views of what should be improved in, term, improved in terms of what will the EU export to them. Um, there are certainly many uh, discussion to have uh, with respect to what the uh, EU intends to sell to the Brazilians and to the uh, uh, Mercosur countries, not only on what we are going to buy, but what are we going to do? We've, um, Shefali have talked about pesticides, pesticides that are forbidden within the EU and that we're still going to, to sell to you. So that's, I think, a quick question for which we will need this, the, the Brazilian, Argentina, Uruguayan, and Paraguayan society to, to raise the voice and to say, well, <clears throat> this very uh, good, uh, maybe, but uh, we, there are this and that type of uh, uh, exchange and products and services that we don't need to favor or um, or a sustainable development transition. Uh, I think that will be my, my last word for, for this for the, for the, for this time. Thank you. Um, 
Looking at the time, I would briefly uh, like to give the floor to the um, AETP um, team because they have uh, elaborated these fact sheets. And I again invite you all to um, download them, look at them in greater detail because we didn't have the time to really uh, go to in, in to detail for all uh, for all four, four of them. So is there anything that you would like to add? Any like major messages, uh, Sharon, Karen, Shefali? I, it's not a major message. I just say that the, this is really complicated stuff. And there's a lot of great material in these fact sheets where we've tried to boil down some of the really complex art, you know, um, facts that are in some of the really thick studies, for example, that uh, Anna has um, put on her website and helped sponsor some really fantastic work. So we hope you'll at least start with those. And then if there's further questions, there's a lot of backup materials that you can have to uh, check into the facts that we've put out there. So. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Anna, thank you so much for having joined us for this um, meeting and of course all to all the panelists. Um, as you're the, the member of European Parliament that has uh, so many different functions, um, some final, final words and then we'll, um, we'll leave it for tonight. No, it's not because of my functions, I have to have the final word, but thank you so much for the uh, great, great webinar. Um, also, I learned again a lot and I think those kind of events are super, super uh, crucial and so congratulations. Thank you so much. And yes, I think uh, indeed we will keep up the work um, looking at 2021 already. Uh, greening trade will be um, a very big topic, not only uh, with regards to the Mercosur um, agreement. I think we've all come to understand that um, the agreement as it stands um, is not fit for the challenges of the 21st century, um, that uh, we need to really rethink trade policy um, in, a, in a substantial um, manner and really rethink the structure, how trade is conducted today, how we can make it compatible with the European Green Deal, with uh, human rights, with compliance with the Paris Agreement, etc. Uh, both within trade agreements, but also outside with due diligence legislation, etc. And I think um, what is also important to keep in mind is that to be credible, um, to be credible on the international uh, scene, um, it is very important to also clean up the own house uh, in the European Union with regards to uh, climate policy. And this week is a very crucial week when it comes to climate policy with the climate law up for debate. Um, and we also had one question about the common agricultural policy. So only if we take biodiversity and climate policy seriously, uh, also within our uh, own borders here in Europe, um, we can be a credible um, actor on the international stage. So thank you everybody for joining in. Thank you to all the participants. Thank you to the panelists. We will keep up the debate um, coming from the fact sheets and, and beyond. So have a great night or a great day in Brazil, depending on where, have, where you have joined in. And thank um, you, bye-bye. We'll continue bye -bye. the debate. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.